own um, notes and um, misled the... Pr yes, that's what I thought. Um, so our next presentation is by two speakers. Are you going to also co-present? Okay, that's very nice. Um, this, uh, these speakers are uh, now both based at uh, Utrecht University, but Claire, you moved quite recently, right? Or not so recently? So um, Claire is a master student there, and uh, Leonie is a PhD candidate. And uh, they're, uh, they're going to talk ab uh, about um, Roma as well, um, but in uh, the context of the Netherlands. And their title is Pushing for Social Change in the Netherlands, Protecting the Cultural Identity of Roma, Sinti and Travelers. Um, um, would you like to be here? Okay, then I'm going to give you both a mic. Oh. Well, thank you so much. Uh, well, thank you all for convening uh, this nice conference. Um, and just to add what uh, Sana already told about Claire and me, um, the reason that we came, uh, became involved with travelers' rights in the Netherlands was for Claire that she started in 2016 with an internship at the Nationale Ombudsman. Uh, and there she contributed to his report on travelers' rights in the Netherlands. And I have worked for the Public Interest Litigation Project since uh, September 2014 and working also specifically on the issue of travelers' rights. Um, and with PILP, I also worked on the case uh, that was just shown uh, by Sanna about uh, Henk Kerse who had to leave uh, his uh, uh, caravan because his mother died. And, uh, well, he got this letter saying, uh, well, condol condolences and uh, now get out. Um, and in our presentation, we will focus on Dutch traveler camps policies, and we use the term travelers in a sense, uh, woonwagenbewoners in Dutch. Uh, so it's a broad concept uh, relating to Roma, Sinti, and any other person who lives in caravans because of their cultural identity or uh, tradition. Um, and this is already showing the extinction policy, because uh, with these photos, I would like to show you what it actually means, uh, what's happening in the Netherlands. Um, and these photos show that um, once a traveler leaves his home or uh, comes to pass, uh, uh, municipalities who had, have adopted the extinction policy place blocks on the side of uh, the caravan sites, uh, so no other traveler could place its caravan there. And then eventually, slowly but surely, uh, the number of caravans uh, would uh, be limited or even uh, extinct completely in that specific uh, municipality. And the first photo on the left is taken in at Os. Uh, it's one of the camps. It's not the camp uh, where this uh, man, Henk Gerse, came from, uh, but it's one of the other camps in that municipality. And the other one is in Eindhoven, uh, which also shows uh, some signs of this uh, kind of uh, extinction policy, which is already, uh, the, the term is already very uh, bad in a way. Uh, but these municipalities weren't the only ones who carried out such a policies. There was also uh, other um, municipalities, uh, which will be shown also by the numerous uh, decisions of the Netherlands Institute of Human Rights, uh, the Dutch equality body. So what happened in the Netherlands is that slowly but surely, Less and less caravans uh, sites were there, whilst the number of uh, travelers seems to grow over the years. Uh, so this puts severe pressure on uh, travelers' lifestyle. And for example, in the situation in Eindhoven, this meant that it was estimated that a traveler would have to wait for 30 years before being uh, eligible for receiving a caravan plot. So it became very difficult uh, for travelers to live in accordance with their traditions. And the lack of caravan sites in the Netherlands was not just an individual or a traveler's loss, but this was also problematic from a human rights perspective. The European Court of Human Rights has already held that there's a positive obligations for states to, um, to facilitate travelers' way of life. And the background to this is that uh, travelers' lifestyle, which means living in caravans with close uh, social and family ties, is so closely intertwined with the identity and culture of travelers, that their lives should receive special protection, uh, especially in light of the vulnerable group uh, they are and the stigmatization and discrimination they are facing. So, and that it is important for travelers to live in caravans, these statements uh, show that for them. 
And what we are going to talk about specifically is the role of the uh, central government that it had in relation to the extinction policy. Um, and even though housing policy in the Netherlands is completely decentralized, meaning that it, municipalities uh, determine what kind of policy they, uh, they carry out, uh, in a guide to municipalities of 2006, uh, the central government actually proposed uh, this policy to uh, municipalities next to some other policies. And the approach chosen by the central government is, has been called a repressive inclusion strategy, a meaning that it aimed to press or even force travelers to assimilate or in terms of the local policy to normalize. Um, well, this was the situation, but this was the situation until mid-2017. Then the government suddenly changed its position and currently it's in the process of adopting a new and we hope <laughs> a fundamental rights proof uh, guide to municipalities. So how did this change came about? What factors might have influenced this 180 degrees change in the stance of the government? Well, this is something Claire will uh, tell you a little bit more about. She will talk about four main national stakeholders which seem to have put pressure on the government for changing its approach. Um, and she will also explain a little bit about the new stance of the government. And at the end of this presentation, I will reflect on the development and conclude with a glance ahead. Uh, and we'll put forward some ideas of how to go forward after uh, this uh, new and hopefully uh, fundamental rights proof guide is adopted. So, thank you. I can use this one or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Okay. So before we move on to the action under, actions undertaken by the stakeholders, resulting in a change as already shortly described by Leni, I will first shortly introduce the different stakeholders. And in the push for a political and legal change, um, four stakeholders can be identified or distinguished. The Netherlands Institute for Human Rights, the National Ombudsman, the Public Interest Litigation Project, and the national and local interest groups. So first, the Netherlands Institute for Human Rights, the NIHR. This is the Dutch equality body, and its task is to oversee compliance by state authorities and private organizations uh, with fundamental rights. And in order to do so, it has two capacities, and in the traveler's case, it used both capacities. Because it started, uh, to ren it rendered uh, 35 decisions on um, cases related to traveler camp policies, and last May it advised the uh, Dutch central government in, on the new, uh, to, the new to, to be designed new guides. Uh, then second, we have the National Ombudsman, which is one of the five high councils of state in the Netherlands. And its main task is um, to scrutinize the manner in which uh, public author sector authorities fulfill their statutory responsibilities. And the central focus point in the work of the NO is always the citizen's perspective. And we can also see this in uh, the work of the NO in relation to the travelers case. But because after receiving uh, several complaints by travelers on the extension policy, the NO started an investigation into the position of travelers in the Netherlands, which resulted in the report of 2017. And then we have the public interest litigation project, which was set up by the Dutch section of the International Commission of Jurists, the NGCM, in 2014, in uh, order to explore possibilities on strategic lit litigation for fundamental rights. And the, one of the first uh, issues taken up by PILP was a traveler's case. And its main aim or goal in this uh, case was to get a judgment on the incompatibility of the extinction policy with fundamental rights. And then last but not least, we have the national and local interest groups. And even, even many years before all the other stakeholders got involved, the, the interest groups were already trying to um, put their issues on the agenda. They did it on a local, national and international level. And um, so they not only play an agenda setting role by actively seeking contact with the stakeholders, but also in, uh, they play a role in mobilizing the community and providing travelers with information on how to seek uh, contact with the municipality or how to strive for more caravan plots in their own municipality. And so now the, the question is, um, what actions did the stakeholders undertake in order um, to 
address the Dutch government to take up its responsibility. And again, it's before I go into more detail in the, the, the actions, it's important to note that um, the actions undertaken by the interest groups are more difficult to pinpoint on specific dates. But on a the background, they played, of course, a very uh, important role by placing the issue on the agenda of the stakeholders. Then we identified 2014 as the starting year. Because in this year, the travelers' culture was recognized as intangible cultural heritage by UNESCO, and it's also the year in which the NIHR rendered its first decision uh, in relation to traveler camp policies. Because it's held that the municipality of Os, as was already mentioned earlier, uh, discriminated travelers by implementing an, ex an extinction policy. And 2014 was also the year in which PILP got involved in the Travelers case. And then building on 2014, 2015 and 2016 further paved the way for the decisive year 2017. And um, some steps of 2015 and 2016 are that uh, in 2016 the NO started its investigation into the Travelers case and in 2015 and 2016 uh, the NIHR rendered 21 decisions uh, on the traveler's case in which it set new standards to be met by municipalities. And also in 2016, uh, PILP uh, wrote an alternative guide uh, for mun municipalities and uh, wrote an amicus curiae letter to the NIHR in um, the case against the Dutch central government. Then we are in 2017, the decisive or crucial year, because this is the year in which the Dutch central government uh, changed its stance and it also started to recognize the identity, the cultural identity of travelers. Because currently um, the Dutch central go government is writing a new guide which is seemingly, which seems to be more fundamental rights proof. And uh, in order to write this new guide, the Dutch central government not only asked for advice from the NIHR, but also organized meetings with uh, the stakeholders, including representatives of the uh, travelers community and PILP. So we can not only see a change uh, when we look at the central government, but also uh, when we look at the stakeholders. Because the last couple of months, they started to use more called uh, soft means, like negotiation um, and uh, yeah, attending the meetings, instead of more like hard means, like uh, bringing cases to court and uh, rendering decisions, uh, publishing reports. And so um, we can see that the actions undertaken by the stakeholders had their effect. Um, and now Leonie will shortly reflect on the actions undertaken by the stakeholders. <laughs> um, so uh, what we have seen from uh, the various contributions these stakeholders had actually with um, making travelers' rights real fundamental rights issue instead of a, a more problem, um, which was the, the perspective taken by the government seemed to be mo mostly aimed at dealing with uh, criminalization or uh, fire safety at, um, at traveler camps. So what these uh, stakeholders did was really place it on the agenda that travelers had rights and that uh, traveler camps policy had actually to do, uh, do with fundamental rights. Um, reflecting on these actions taken is that you can see that the actions of those stakeholders were not only aimed at the national level, but were also aimed at the local level. For example, the many decisions by the Dutch equality body, um, the case of PILP, um, and the National Ombudsman report was also aimed at the municipalities as well as at the national level. So focusing on different uh, issues help to really place this issue on the agenda. <clears throat> um, and what you can also see is that these stakeholders actually strengthened each other's work. Um, a good example of this was that the first decision of the Dutch equality body um, was the basis, uh, the start for uh, PILP to start uh, to take up this case. Uh, as well as that PILP made, uh, wrote an amicus curia letter to uh, the Dutch equality body, which served as a, a kind of a, a help for uh, the Dutch equality body to uh, take a stance uh, in relation to the central government. But 
Next to all these developments, what you can see throughout the, all these developments is that travelers had played such an important role. They were the ones who contacted the National Ombudsman. They informed Bill, uh, and they started the procedures with uh, the Dutch equality body. So uh, basically what you can see is that uh, the plurality of stakeholders and the focusing on different aspects of traveler camps policy in the Netherlands through different means, through lobbying, through uh, starting um, case procedures, uh, really helped to put pressure on uh, the government to change its stance. Of course, um, this was not without uh, its challenges. Um, and we, we go run into this issue of challenges more uh, thoroughly in our paper, uh, but I just want to mention three th uh, things over here. Um, is that once it became clear that the government would change its stance, um, the question arose with certain uh, stakeholders whether um, the government might be um, want to ch choose for the lowest uh, um, fundamental rights standards as possible, meaning that uh, if one stakeholder would say, uh, as in regards to this particular issue, you only have to meet these standards, whilst the others would uh, require higher standards, that uh, the lowest standard would uh, be chosen. In that way, some of the stakeholders really tried to stay on the same page and had conversations and talks with each other to see uh, what the perspective was of the other goal, uh, the stakeholders. Uh, an additional uh, problem or uh, challenge uh, these stakeholders uh, saw was the group of travelers. Uh, this relates to Roma, Sinti, and travelers. It's a broad and diverse group with each their own culture and traditions. Um, who can be seen as representing these groups? Of course, you can't talk to everybody, uh, these, especially these legal stakeholders. You can't speak to everyone. So who can be considered as representing the, these groups? And to avoid such problems as misrepresentation, um, what these organizations have tried to be doing is to uh, opt for a broad inclusion strategy uh, through opening up their channels to as many individuals and interest groups as possible. Uh, a good example of this is the uh, Nationale Ombudsman, who opened up a complaint hotline by which travelers, Roma and Sinti, could call with complaints and concerns uh, relating to traveler camps. One last point uh, that I would also like to mention is the stigmatization of these groups. By focusing on their cultural identity, there might be an adverse effect um, that this would actually lead to more uh, stigmatization in the media or by Dutch citizens because focusing or emphasizing cultural identity might mean that people regard them as even more as others or different. Um, so uh, these stakeholders opted for strategic choices uh, concerning how to inform the media and when to inform them. Um, and also a very positive development is that interest groups themselves try to really um, to show the positive sides of their communities. For example, by organizing a Roma Pride each year uh, to show this is what our culture entails and there's a lot of music and songs over there as well. So uh, to send out a positive message. So all in all, it seems that the actions of the stakeholders have been able to provide certain pressure on the, uh, the, uh, the Dutch government and led to political and legal change in the Netherlands. Well, this is at the national level. This is, however, not the end of things, because as the Nationale Ombudsman also noted, there are still some municipalities who refuse to in implement new uh, fundamental rights proof policies. Still plenty of work to do. Um, Yet, if you look at some of the stakeholders, not all of them will and can be uh, involved in the same way as they have done over the past years uh, to uh, fight for travelers' rights. Um, and to ensure that fundamental rights, their, that their fundamental rights knowledge of, uh, for example, PILP and uh, the National Ombudsman and the Dutch Equality Body um, remains, uh, it's very important that these uh, stakeholders um, uh, share their legal expertise in such a way as to empower travelers in the fight to the recognition of their rights. Because ultimately, 
it will, it will be travelers themselves who can truly ensure that human rights will be protected on each and every level of society. Thank you. Okay, um, actually, uh, we're now going to stay on the page of uh, Roma, uh, Sinti and Travelers, but we're going to look at this from a different angle. And um, our next speaker is Helen Hinches from ISS here. Um, she's she's co-written a paper um, with um, Isidora Ovalle, also um, affiliated to ISS, but she's going to present it by herself. And I'm going to give you a mic. Do you want, and I maybe you want it on the stand? <laughs> okay, hi folks. Um, actually, that almost relates exactly to the last sentence, which I think you, you, you had in your paper, which is this point that Vaclav Havel once made, which is that, um, you know, it's not, this is not just an issue relevant to Roma. And I, I'm not a Roma, I have to say, and neither is my co-author, uh, Isadora Ovale Pena. We're not Roma, as far as we know. And uh, there is a risk when, uh, you know, there's an awful lot of Roma scholarship uh, by non-Roma, and there's also a lot of scholarship now by Roma scholars. And um, the, the risk generally is of, like uh, too much by non-Roma, but never mind. I was persuaded to do this paper by Jeff. <laughs> He's very persuasive sometimes. And the point here is about general rights, actually. So the reason I'm looking at this case is not because I'm going to kind of speak for Roma, but because I think this, has, this is a litmus test for Europe. And it's not just now. <laughs> it's been a litmus test for Europe for a rather a long time, uh, quite a few centuries, actually. We've kind of failed. So I'm afraid I've cynically titled my paper, Failing the Litmus Test. I don't know how, okay, there we go. So this is some of our students. I'm going to start with a monument just around the corner. It's in Elandstraat. And actually, the paper has the full text of the monument. And I took some students a couple of years ago to see this monument. I don't think any of them would have actually noticed it if I hadn't taken them to see it at the beginning of the year. But it is much more visible than it was 10 years ago when it was just a plaque on the wall at a disappeared courtyard. And it took till 2008 for this to be put up, but in Berlin, it took till 2012 for Angela Merkel to put up a monument to the Sinti, so a rather Roma and Sinti. So I've got some quotes in the paper, actually, from um, some interesting sources, including Ian Hancock's book, which I recommend, called We, we the Romani People. For someone who's th who doesn't know much about the history, Hancock goes into quite a lot of uh, kind of detail without being too academic. And he also tells you that all these famous characters that you didn't know were Roma are Roma at the back, including Charlie Chaplin. So, who everyone thinks is Jewish. <laughs> so, um, basically, let's continue, otherwise I'll just waffle. I don't have it, okay. So, um, yeah, this is Article 14, which I got interested in because I started just very superficially looking through some European Court of Human Rights cases. And it kept saying, no, no violation, no violation. I thought, no. And every time it said no, I went, oop, another, oop, another one, oop, another one, oop. And it kept going on like that. And it went on like that till 2005. And then it went, oop, violation. And then it was like, violation, 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 violation. And it went about 2010, 11, 12. No violation, no violation, no violation. So I discovered a kind of pattern. I mean, I haven't discovered it. Other people have written about it. But I, I was like quite surprised because the 2005 ruling that we can look at, which kind of changed the willingness of the court to find in favor of this kind of discrimination, has, has had an impact and things have changed a little. But there's been a kind of relapse into the pre-2005 situation in a number of recent cases. And let's, I'm just going to quickly look at that, some of that. So they did not use Article 14 for a long time when it came to like really flagrant cases like people running in the street, killing Roma, burning their houses, shouting Roma abuse, uh, racist abuse, but no, no Article 14 violation found. It's like, oh, okay. Um, and this has puzzled a number of authors, and there's been a really good study by Hermida, uh, a book, a whole full-length book on, on uh, racism in Europe, and two chapters by her on the Roma, two different kinds of chapters, and uh, they're really useful to start with. Um, and so she describes the situation. I don't need to, 
she says, until the beginning of 2004, Article 14 was hardly ever uh, found to have been violated. Everything else was violated, the right to, to family life, the right to privacy, the right to life, but not the right to be free of discrimination. And these are some cases which we review in the paper. I just list them because some of you may know some of them. <laughs> the Buckley case is the first one. It's from the UK. It's a very long, long, long-standing, long-running thing. Some of these cases run for 20 years because they may run for 10 years, say, in Romania or Croatia, and then another eight, nine years in the European Court of Human Rights. So some of these cases may be referring to is issues that date back to the early 90s and are not decided until, say, 2009 in the court. So actually, a lot of the worst cases uh, are either quite recent or date from the period when the former so-called socialist and communist bloc was breaking up and things were getting a bit hairy economically. So you'll find that economic pressure is a large part of the uh, underpinning of anti-Roma violence, uh, not only uh, in Europe historically, but today also in, in parts of Eastern Europe, and not just there. You've got the case of France, which we'll come back to later. Um, so, I've actually got some, some notes on each case, and Isadora helped me with this. She went through the cases painstakingly and pulled out some information on each one. So, if you want to read in more detail, the paper is available or can be made available. Um, this is actually a, a judge called... Um, this is a... Uh, yeah. Okay, so basically, in this case, Anguilova versus Bulgaria 2002, there was one dissenting judge who actually felt that Article 14 had been violated. And he did us a great service, and he's quoted in all the papers, because he actually made a statement about the European Court of Human Rights. And I think this is it. Yeah. This is a great statement. I just recommend you read it. Can you see it from the back? It's so sarcastic. <laughs> I, do, I do love this judge's statement. Just, you know, leafing, which is exactly what we were doing, just leafing through the annals. And he says, you know, it's an exemplary haven of ethnic fraternity, Europe. Yeah, so I, I, I love that irony. I love the sarcasm. <laughs> I'm so glad it was recorded. <laughs> I'm so glad he put his statement down there because that's been used by a lot of uh, scholars since then as a, as a kind of, and also by lawyers, as a kind of, a, his statement was the first openly dissenting statement about this Article 14 that has expressed it in these terms. And that's really what I picked on. I picked on the issue of history, because I think that the problem is in fact histor historical and the lack of awareness. And that's also why I started with the monument, because recognizing the Sinti as being victims of ro European racism across the board is actually still not fully acknowledged today. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that uh, in the rest of the paper. So many other cases, uh, Judge Bonello is not the only one who spoke out against the unwillingness to use Article 14. There were other judges who also expressed their dissenting statements. And here's some statistics which have just been allowed in 2017. The European Court is now allowed to look at statistics in order to prove discrimination. And here's just a couple of statistics from way before then, which showed that Roma in Bulgaria were three times more likely to be subjected to physical violence in police stations than people of ethnic Bulgarian origin. So those figures were around for a, a decade and a half before statistics were allowed to be used. Okay, positive image of Europe. Europe is a wonderful place, isn't it? Yes. Well, I mean, these days we don't have so many illusions about Europe, but I think we have to remember that just before, say, a few years ago, when the far right started becoming stronger in a number of countries, we did think Europe was a kind of, you know, and so did the rest of the world, a kind of haven of democracy and democratic values and equal rights and non-discrimination. So the positive image has taken longer to disappear than the positive realities. And uh, this is one of the issues that's interesting in terms of the Roma. And my suggestion is that uh, the European Court has been very reluctant to denounce individual countries, uh, whether it's Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia, or indeed France, UK. They're very reluctant to find with Article 14 because it actually implies that the European area is not an area free of discrimination and ethnic racism. And the court doesn't really like to 
accuse individual countries of not having goodwill. So, for instance, you'll see in the discussions that the country will say, the country government will say, well, we've introduced a new law, and we're going to change that. We've got uh, new policies in place. They're, that's going to change. They come back five years later. Has that changed? No, sorry. <laughs> we didn't get around to that. We've been so busy with the economic recession or with unemployment, we haven't actually desegregated the schools in Greece or we haven't actually done what you, we said we'd do with housing, but we assure you we will now do it. And by the way, we've got 35 million euros of compensation for the victims who were made homeless. Oh, that's good, says the court. That's nice. That's good. And they go away again for another three, four years. <laughs> and there is a lot of non-compliance. So... This is interesting about Roma racism and perhaps every marginalized group, it's their own fault. So what happens in fact is a kind of normalization of the argument that yes, but you see, this community isn't like other minorities. They're not like, you know, kind of nice hardworking immigrants or, you know, the Jewish community. They don't really have anything. Com this group is really, you don't understand it until, you know, you live with them. You know, they have, they're, cr they're criminals, there's this and that. And, you know, there's a normalization of racism, which in fact starts what I call blaming the victim. It does what Michael William Ryan said in 1971 about welfare beneficiaries in the U.S. blame the victim. Because when you blame the victim, it's so much easier to just not find with discrimination. Because they bring it on themselves. Their lifestyle, their, I don't know, the culture we've been talking about, also, so, so on and so forth. Um, which can be expressed in very caring terms. You know, these poor people, they need to be helped to uplift their economic situation, et cetera, et cetera. They need better housing, need better schooling. But at the same time, discrimination is not seen as the problem. It's the, some kind of lack in the community of self-improvement. So here are some negative images, you know, which you, you find uh, not so much in the court cases, but certainly in the literature. Um, and I, I like the expression, the taken for granted nature of Roma racism. You know, you can have a conversation with almost anyone in a bus and they'll have a story for you about the time that their mom was robbed by her neighbors who were blah, blah, blah. It's, it's all over. So these long established ideas operate in the court, in the heads of judges. And one of the problems we have in Europe, I'm convinced, is un recognizing, if I can call it that, <laughs> the long, long history of not only slavery, but during the Holocaust and long before then and since. We've had a very long history of racism and it's domestic. And we don't consider racism to be something domestic. We consider it something to be out there. We forget about Ireland, <laughs> which was <laughs> colonized for about 800 years by Britain. We forget about uh, so many other domestic colonialisms that have existed in Europe. So, um, we have a case dating back to 1991, which was finally decided on in 2009, when a whole village was made homeless. Uh, after their homes were burned, uh, the contents of the homes were burned, and after 20 years, this community, these particular individuals who are still alive, oh, definitely, more, no, no more than five minutes, we're almost done, um, are still battling away. So the number of cases, uh, the litigants have died, <laughs> their relatives take over the case, um, and there's still no um, uh, end in sight to the, to the problem of compensating or providing housing. In this case, it's in uh, Romania. Okay, a few more cases. Uh, you know, this is probably one of the most uh, shocking ones, and I think here the court had trouble not finding discrimination, but I think did they find it here? No. <laughs> 400 to 500 people demonstrating in public with the local MP. <laughs> um, claiming that the whole community of Hungarians was protecting themselves from Roma. They are protecting themselves from Roma. Uh, demanding the death penalty, threatening the Roma community in public. This is the, the MP. Participants had sticks, whips, stones, which were thrown at people. Nine... Far-right groups were collected there in this particular place in paramilitary uniform, marching up and down the road where they knew that the Roma lived. <laughs> Not discrimination. 
Um, now, unfortunately, this is quite a recent case. It's way after the 2004 case. It's way after the fact that the EU, the European Court, rather recognised that they had a bit of a problem in 2004. They acknowledged that, but again, no Article 14, just private and family life. So I don't know how far the court has gone in acknowledging its prejudices, but. Um, as economic crisis deepens, of course, you can always expect scapegoating to increase and to intensify and living conditions to become more difficult for both the mainstream society and the uh, s segregated or uh, stigmatized uh, minority. Z so how can Europe move forward in tackling this kind of uh, blindness, if you want to be polite? Not believing that governments will do what they say they'll do is, is a step in the right direction, but I'm afraid that that's probably not going to change. There are neither carrots nor sticks to be used with governments at the moment. Um, there isn't much in the way of... There's no enforcement, and there's not much in the way of incentives. Money that's provided, which is regularly provided, disappears. So, um, How can we expect poachers to police themselves? Something like that. There's no gamekeepers as far as one can see in some cases. So my conclusion is that in the paper I go into it much more, that the only way we can actually overcome anti-Roma racism is to do a little bit of reading about history and to have a better idea of what happened to Roma in Eastern Europe during the period from, I think it was Vlad the Impaler and uh, onwards, um, the, the period of about three to 400 years, three, let's say 300 years when Roma were actually enslaved so we have some parallels there with uh, African-Americans. And the period uh, in the Second World War, which has been misreported quite a bit uh, as being a period when the Nazis, believing that some Roma were descended from Aryans, don't ask me about those theories, please, should be preserved for all perpetuity. But where, in fact, Rudolf Hess describes how in the camp they were all liquidated. Uh, now we are going to do a little bit of moving around because I want to invite Jeff for... Oh, Jeff. oh no, no, whoosh. I'm, I'm sorry. No, you're, you're right. I, I, I was like, I was so focused on keeping time that I, I was thinking, uh, I was not thinking straight. Uh, we are going to take, a, the, we are going to take a shift because we're going to broaden the perspective with, um, with Kristen and Rai's paper. Um, Kristen, you also want this and this? Um, um, Just click the down, arrow down, down, arrow down. Yeah. So uh, Kristin and is going to speak about integration reasoning in the European Court of Human Rights. So she's following up on uh, Helen Hinch's uh, um, presentation, but in a different way because she's going to focus more on the reasoning of uh, of the court in relation to citizenship. Kristin, uh, she's of course from uh, Erasmus School of Law. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so no need to make the link myself. The link has been made for me. Um, so let's first have, uh, oops, all right, okay, I need to shuffle around my papers otherwise, I don't know, see, see how I can do that, all right, basically, turning to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, it's undi undeniably one of the most respected international courts dealing with uh, human rights, its jurisprudence is often a source of inspiration for other international and national courts. Now, regarding minorities, the court indeed has come a long way since its early jurisprudence in which the absence of a minority-specific provision in the Convention translated into a very restrictive interpretation of the Convention rights in relation to claims put forward by ethnic, religious, and linguistic uh, minorities. Uh, indeed, the court is now, its jurisprudence opens more generously towards substantive, real equality, going beyond formal equality, and you know, open also towards the protection of the separate identity of minorities, at least in theory. Because indeed, I have, as it's been highlighted several times, also in my own writing, uh, the jurisprudence of the court still paints a rather mixed picture, uh, also because beautiful theoretical principles do not necessarily translate into effective protection in concrete uh, cases. Here, I'm going to focus on several recent cases that actually revolve centrally around the place of religious minorities in uh, societies, in European societies, 
in which the court accepts far-reaching restrictions on the rights of religious minorities with a migrant background in the name of respect for minimum requirements of life in society, living together, social integration. Basically, the central argument being that in these cases, uh, the court drifts away from the counter-majoritarian core of human rights protection in the process, turns around several of its steady lines of jurisprudence that are favorable to minorities, um, basically uh, allowing the state in the name of social integration, in the name of an integrated society, to push religious minorities with a migrant background out of the public space, out of public schools, excluding them, marginalizing them, or allowing them to be excluded, to be marginalized more specifically, thus moving away from an equal, inclusive citizenship. So, oh, I'm running behind with my slides, apparently, apologies. So maybe I should turn it a little bit more so I see what, I'm, what happens there. Okay. Yeah, but it's a bit small. <laughs> I should put my glasses on, granted. Okay, so uh, what am I going to uh, do? First of all, I'll critically analyze uh, the two most prominent judgments. On the one hand, SES versus France, you might have heard about that one, uh, and Osmanoglu and Koshabas versus Switzerland. Um, I will, in view of time constraints, focus especially on the first one, so I would like you to tell me how much minutes I have when I start with Osmanoglu so I can constrain that accordingly then highlighting more pulling together critical remarks that I've made throughout the analysis in terms of fundamental rights on the one hand, integration on the other, and thus ultimately in terms of citizenship, leading to a conclusion with recommendations towards the European Court of Human Rights and the way it develops its jurisprudence. Turning to SAS, uh, SAS concerns a French Muslima who regularly wears a full face veil in public and who claims that the French law that criminalizes that prohibits and criminalizes the wearing of uh, garments that conceal the face in public spaces, that that law violates her freedom to manifest her religion and constitutes indirect discrimination on the basis of religion because it disproportionately affects women who want to wear, uh, for religious reasons, a garment that covers their face. Now, the court accepts that the law amounts to a limitation of her right to manifest her religion, and it also acknowledges that this law particularly affects Muslim women who, for religious reasons, want to cover their face. Nevertheless, the court considers that this limitation does not amount to a violation because it would be justified there being a legitimate aim and the limitation being proportionate to that legitimate aim. Now, several critical remarks can be made in regard to these two steady criteria that the court always uses to evaluate uh, whether or not the limitation to a fundamental right is legitimate or not. First of all, the question of uh, the legitimate aim. So the court accepts the government's argument in, in terms of minimum requirements of life within French society that that amounts to one of the limited exhaustively enumerated legitimate aims in the convention, namely the rights of others. That raises the question, like, who are these others that we're talking about, at the protection of whose rights would legitimate a limitation of the rights of these religious minorities? Now, interestingly, if you look at the reasoning of the government, the government basically says, wearing a face covering veil that would express the rejection of the majority and the will to isolate oneself from the rest of society. So basically, and that would then be contrary to the French idea of fraternity and, and would amount to a manifest refusal of the principle of living together. So clearly, the government opposed, you know, considers these rights of others as the rights of the majority. Then what are these minimum requirements of life within French society and who identifies these requirements? Uh, there, when you look at the government's arguments, it's a very particular conception that is being put forward supposedly reflecting the mores of the French society. Basically, the government states that concealing one's face in public spaces inhibits the possibility of interpersonal relationships, and this would, by virtue of established consensus, form an indispensable element of community life within the French society. Now, the applicant clearly, keenly feels the one-sidedness of this vision of what living together means, and it basically says, well, 
the government's conception of the minimum requirements of living together fails to take into account cultural practices of minorities, which did not share this philosophy. Um, so the government's line of argumentation opposes the rights of the majority to the rights of the minority, the latter being able to trump the former, or at least that would be the idea behind that reasoning. And unfortunately, uh, the court, sorry, I'm going too fast here, the court goes along with that reasoning. The court says that it is able to accept, and I'm quoting here, that the barrier raised against others by a veil concealing the face is perceived by the respondent state as breaching the rights of others to live in a space of socialization which makes living together easier. Now, arguably, in accepting this line of argumentation, uh, the court's reasoning is fundamentally at odds with the counter-majoritarian core uh, of human rights. And this majoritarian drive that you see in the identification of what amounts, what legitimate aim is invoked, uh, is further hardened by the way the court deals with its proportionality assessment. And more particularly by the total disregard of the divergent views on integration put forward by the minorities related to the broad margin of appreciation that the court grants to the state. Now, interestingly, when the court was reviewing the legitimate aim invoked by the state, namely living together requirement, the court acknowledges that this, has, this, this notion is, has a very high inherent flexibility and thus is prone to abuse. And this would then call for careful examination, reading heightened scrutiny. Uh, that's what it would seem to say. In the same vein, the court expresses a concern about all kinds of information it had received that there had been Islamophobic remarks during the parliamentary ne negotiations of that particular law. And the court itself, in that respect, notes, well, a, a state that then proceeds with such, such a law basically runs the risk of consolidating stereotypes and basically uh, encouraging the expression of intolerance instead of promoting tolerance. But by the time the court gets to the actual proportionality review, it conveniently forgets its own hints at the need for heightened scrutiny, and it basically frames the matter in such a way that it can grant that it appears reasonable or appropriate to grant France a broad margin of appreciation. So on the one hand, it says, well, you know, this question whether or not it should be permitted to wear this full face veil, that is a choice of society. And that ties in with general policy choices which always lead to a broad margin according to the court. And then it also has a very interesting, very long-winded, very confusing to my mind, argumentation about the fact that there would not be European consensus on the matter, uh, which would also point to a broad margin. So basically, by pointing to this, by choosing to frame the matters in such a way that it grants a broad margin and thus can conclude to a non-violation, the court allows France to impose the national way of life on the minorities them and basically pushing them de facto out of the public space. How am I doing, Tam? Perfect. Okay. Then turning to Osman Oglu, the other case, different, sorry, sometimes too slow, sometimes too fast with my clicks. I'll try to be better with it. Osman Oglu and Kosabas, uh, here a particular expression of religious convictions was not criminalized, but parents had to pay a pretty high fine uh, for not letting their girls participate in mixed swimming classes in their public school because, of, because that would be contrary to their religious convictions. Now, also here, sorry, again too fast, the court acknowledges the, the impossibility to obtain an exemption, and that the kids didn't have to participate in the swimming classes, that that amounts to an interference with the religious rights of the parents. But also here, the court concludes that, you know, there's no violation because the interference has a legitimate aim and is proportionate to that legitimate aim. Again, critical remarks can be made about both of these. Um, here, the legitimate aim invoked was that, you know, not allowing that exemption would optimize social integ integration of foreign children from different cultures and religions. Uh, that being then, the, so the rights of others and so again, you see rights of others reflecting uh, the need for an integrated society. So again, an opposition of majority rights to minority rights. And again, the court grants a very broad margin to the government because it would concern you know, the relations between state and church, about which there is no consensus, and because it would be public education, etc., etc. In the process, uh, 
totally glossing over the countervailing arguments of the parents about, in terms of integration. So basically, so the court follows the government's contention that, you know, schooling has a central importance for the process of social integration and, very interesting, complete schooling allowing successful integration according to local customs and habits would prevail over the wish of parents to exempt them. Um, the parents, on the other hand, had said, so the court goes along with that, and the, but the parents had said, well, yes, integration is very important. We totally agree, and we are perfectly integrated. We've been living and working here forever. We speak the language. We respect constitutional democratic principles. We, we respect the local social customs, etc., etc." Why on earth would our integration of our children hinge on this, whether or not they participate in this mixed swimming class? And they had lots of other arguments, but all of them were swiped away by the government, by, sorry, by the court, because in the framework of this broad margin of appreciation, it <coughs> slavishly almost follows the arguments of the government and simply dismisses every counter argument put forward by the parents. So again, we see um, that in the process, the, uh, the court allows Switzerland to impose the national way of life, the majority's customs and habits as superior on the migrant minorities, sacrificing the fundamental rights of the religious minorities in the process, and pushing them out of public schools in this respect. Turning, <laughs> I was again late, excuse me, with this, yes. So. Highlighting the problems that I've made or highlighting, pulling together the issues that I've identified already. First of all, in terms of rights, um, the court enables the governments to impose the majority's ways of life uh, in the name of the integrated society, sacrificing the minority's fundamental rights in the process. And this actually amounts to an unfortunate retreat in the court's case law, even at the matter of, of principle here, uh, because there is a steady line of jurisprudence about the importance of pluralism, and that the, you know, the protection of minorities, the minority should be protected against undue majority pressure. And of course, we have this very famous Chapman judgment, and which has been repeated several times since then, that there is a state duty to take minorities' needs, ways of life, into account when making laws and when applying laws. So beautiful principles all, which now seem to be conveniently forgotten uh, in some kind, in this apparently matter that is very close to the heart of the state. And because basically what you see almost happening is, as I say, it's the reversal of the human rights logic. Normally, when something falls in the scope of application of a fundamental right, governments need to have damn good reasons to be able to limit the exercise of these rights. Here, we see almost, we see happening that religious minorities can only have and express or uh, live or um, exercise, sorry, their fundamental rights insofar as that is acceptable to the majority. It's the, the whole concept, the whole idea, upside down. That in terms of fundamental rights. What about integration? Because, of course, these cases were all put in the framework of integration. Now, there is an abundance of integration literature in social science. Of course, no way I'm going to get to that in this brief couple of minutes I have left. Uh, but, okay, let's highlight there are very many different views about what integration means, what it takes. Uh, one particularly controversy being, of course, the one that is central in these cases, namely, can you have, can you be successfully integrated, fully integrated, while maintaining a separate minority identity? Now, while this is still con a controversial question, at the same time we see a particular a trend towards a vision of integration as a two-way process, also because it's promote, strongly promoted by the EU. Integration as a two-way process, what do I mean? It's more like it's not that the minority needs to adapt to what the majority says. It's a mutual, a process of mutual ongoing accommodation that uh, is envisaged. What you see, however, with the court and the court's reasoning is in its exclusive following of the government's vision of what integration is, pointing towards a vision of integration as a one-way process, basically meaning the minorities need to give up their separate identity insofar as they want to become, you know, address or be in the public space. Um, furthermore, what you also see in the court uh, is that, it, especially in the last one, in the Osmanoglu case, that it seems to narrow integration down as if it can be, uh, well, it presents integration as if it can be narrowed down to one particular thing, namely, in this case, whether or not they swim in mixed swimming classes or not, uh, disregarding the fact that the integration process is a multidimensional process uh, which applies to all kinds of, all spheres of life. The argument made by the parents, by the way. What now in terms of, what does this mean in terms of citizenship? Now, 
Similarly, very wide jurisprudence, well, literature on citizenship, nationality in that respect as well. Um, very old idea, for that matter, and it's often been traced back to Aristotle or even before. Core idea being concerns a relationship between an individual and a political community, a polity. Now, just as in relation to integration, there are very many dimensions of uh, citizenship. On the, there's this, the legal citizenship, uh, referring to the, the, the nationality, the citizenship, the identity card, the passport question, huh? if you want. But there's also several other dimensions which can be grouped together in terms of substantive citizenship. Access to rights and then equal access to rights. There we come again, equality, right? Participation, not only political, but also socioeconomic participation. And then you can put it more broadly, participating in society at all, if you like. Uh, and then last but not least, collective identity, belonging, who determines the collective idea, who decides what that is, what that amounts to. Now, in this particular case, the persons were all legal citizens. So the problems they encounter are in terms of substantive citizenship. More particularly, as I already claimed, as, was, as I said to be my central argument, the court allows states to exclude these migrant religious minorities from the public space, marginalizing them in the process. Well, how do you see that in SAS? Here I'd like to point to, uh, out to the, the fact that some um, arguments may put forward by third party interveners uh, of SAS, They're pointing out, well, listen, these women, when they were wearing the burqa, they were very much willing and able and participating in society. They were actually participating. Once this law came about, and when they are feeling strongly about their religious beliefs, well, they think they, think they should stay inside because they can't come inside of their constantly being fined. So they're not allowed to do that. So they feel they're actually staying inside and they're basically um, you know, isolating themselves from the rest of society. So it's quite interesting. In the name of living together and promoting an integrated society, what the result is totally counterproductive, the group's staying actually inside. Uh, similar things was, uh, was visible in Osmanoglu. One of the, par parents, the arguments of the parents included also that while well, they actually feel now pressured to pull their kids out of the public school put them in private Muslim schools. Not that that's what they want, but if they are not allowed to live or, or, or to, you know, to manifest their religious beliefs in the public schools, well, that's what they need to do, right? So this, again, this dilemma that they're placed for, which shouldn't be the case. Um, so that is, leads to the point that in the, all of that shows an undermining of the equal inclusive citizenship idea. Bringing me to my last slide, uh, my conclusion, especially my recommendation for the ECHR. Basically, back to basics, back to the core of human rights and back to promoting an inclusive citizenship. So on the one hand, that means reversing this majoritarian drive that I identified, uh, not getting caught in shady integration arguments by governments, and uh, promoting inclusive citizenship, which you know, would allow the court to go back to one of the, you know, several of the basic values that it itself underlines as being to the, going to the core of the ECHR, namely pluralism and substantive equality. And of course I know that it is not straightforward and we see it every day that states are particularly sensitive and, you know, um, reluctant to accept too much meddling in these questions if they consider to be part of their national constitutional identity. Let's not forget the Lao Tzu case, right, with the, with the cross and this, where we had this whole Haitha of like 33 intervening states before the Grand Chamber. Uh, well, I'm not going to go into that, but anyway, that's a very nice example where you see how close, how states feel that this is really getting to the core of their identity, not allowing, literally saying they don't allow the court to get into that sphere. So I acknowledge that what I'm saying is not something that can just happen overnight. Nevertheless, I would argue that, or I would still recommend the court to do this on a step-by-step -step process, as they have done so in other types of contentious, controversial questions. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, Jeff, now indeed. Uh, trying again. Now the floor is indeed yours. Uh, do you want to sit down or want, want the mic? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, okay. Um, oh, that's all right. Uh, I, d I really don't need to be on a screen. No, absolutely not. Okay, um, sincere thanks to the organizers and to all of the panelists for this opportunity. Um, 
And after that, a disclaimer. I'm, I'm pretty far outside my field and comfort zone here, which I am told was the point. There is a risk to that, and I want to apologize in advance. Um, there is a mild link up, and that is I'm involved in a summer program this July at which Yella Klasa from the PILP will be speaking on some of the experiences in the Roma Sinti litigation. The, the school is on international lawyering and a public interest, and the idea is to exchange ideas about what works and how we can do more of it. I mention that because I did not really have time to tie together my individual comments to the paper under a single theme, but there really is one working in the background. I've just mentioned it, and it, and it relates to uh, the shared interest that the organizers have already flagged in questions of mobilization. Okay, so without further ado, let me go individually um, in the order of presentations. Um, Yulia, um, my questions arise um, out of your vocabulary, which gives me a more or less specific angle to ask about the way you're using theory in the paper and what you intend to do with it. Um, simply enough, I wonder about the invisible edge. What is it, um, really? How does it work? Um, the metaphor, assuming it is that, threatens to obscure, for me, more than it clarifies. Um, and in some ways, it seems not to line up with aspects of the argument. Um, what is the opposition, for instance, if there is, between exceptional cases, marginal cases, and an invisible edge? Um, perhaps the idea conveys a sort of paradox. Paradoxes, though, don't exactly communicate political urgency um, without more. Um, I take it that the real point is not to blur a paradigm, but to improve people's lives, which, which I take more out of the style um, from the paper than anything else. And in that light, the solidarity that you sketch in part two um, is provocative, but can cut two ways. Speaking analytically, it runs the risk of being uh, somewhat trivial, frankly. Um, as a political project, it looks exciting, possibly. Um, as a political project, though, uh, the theory seems to get in its own way at points. What is the concrete basis for this solidarity? Who else can be allies and on what basis? Um, maybe I'm asking you to be clearer about what lies either side of this invisible edge or something like that. But also, um, you raised the class dynamic, at least in, um, yeah, in the PowerPoints that I saw. You raised the class dynamic under socialist regimes. How does this compare with the big politics um, of solidarity that you seem to be more or less hinting at? Um, I gather you mean a different sort of politics, and I would be glad to know more about the ways and means of whatever else is possible um, that, that you envision. Okay. Um, Claire and Leone. I, I really enjoyed this paper. I, I want to make that very clear. I thought this was um, uh, great. Um, and I appreciate the modesty in the paper. Um, it, it's a very descriptive paper, and you've held at arm's length um, what I s suspect was an, a, a push that you've received from other people to talk about what else we can learn from it. And I'm still going to ask the same question. <laughs> Um, uh, how am I going to do this? Um, the the, surely there is some teaching dimension beyond the agnosticism that, with this descriptive technique. Yeah? Um, I, I assume the paper is not simply, your point in the paper and the argument you want to make is not simply whatever each next reader um, reads into the paper. Um, what consequences, I have to figure out my own organizational scheme, which looks like this, by the way, in case you're wondering why I'm struggling so much. Um, being clearer about the arguments that can be taken away from this other than as a recounting of what happened possibly on a sui generis basis. I think will have consequences um, for some of the choices you make. 
The list of elements in your descriptive exercise, which is thorough and compelling, is also familiar. Yeah? And I suspect that if you were um, still pushed a little more in terms of what's being mobilized, how, or what you want mobilized out of this, you might have gone towards still other possibilities for analysis. Um, things that could have been drawn out in some of the alliances among stakeholders, etc. But having used that word, this idea of um, bringing out perspectives has some particular questions for me, and they go straight to the stakeholders themselves. Um, they exist in this story almost like magic beneficent agents. Yeah, the, sort of Prince Charmings, almost. Yeah? I'd like to know more about them. Um, what makes a stakeholder a stakeholder in this story? What motivates a stakeholder in this story? Um, more critically, with respect to the use of the word at all, is why call them stakeholders? Why the economic language? Um, what stakes do they hold? Yeah? And, and what would happen if you uh, used other words like ally? Yeah? Um, something more to tell me about the agency of these actors and what they're doing in this story and what we know about how we might mobilize similar actors in other contexts. Um, okay, Helen, <laughs> this is a funny setup. Great. Um, this, the, the paper um, that you've written together with Isadora is, is ambitious. Um, just on a quick exercise, I listed um, the, an inquiry into enacted citizenship as a theoretical construct an argument about collective amnesia, um, a case law review, and, an, and a different legal argument about Article 14 uh, anti-discrimination law. Um, I found, e either the paper or I struggled with these several ambitions. Um, it, it was hard for me to square the enacted citizenship inquiry with the case law review. The limitation to a sort of case note style analysis seemed frankly to impoverish the activist promise in what you were telling me about enacted citizenship. Um, it was also hard to square the collective amnesia with the arguments organized around anti-discrimination law. The collective amnesia is more asserted than proved, uh, and in very broad terms, and on one level I, I understand this, but on another level it does interfere with some of the claims in the paper. Um, it, it makes it hard, for instance, to account for change, this, this massive constant collective amnesia, with change such as the Moldova II case seems to represent. How do you get this waveform of, of activism if the collective amnesia is constant and everywhere? Um, Likewise, it seems to undermine aspects of the legal, act, legal argument proper, such as the, the, the history of reports uh, represented by the ECRI. Yeah. Um, altogether, what you have, what I read is a variety of provocative building blocks in the paper. Um, and their combination as it is right now suggests to me two or three things, the third being a book length project. Um, but one would be that each benefits from more thorough treatment on, it, on its own, and once done, the potential contradictions between these several studies seems to me capable of, of um, producing new and productive possibilities yet to explore. Um, and, and finally, uh, Kristen, I, I really enjoyed this paper. I had just enough time to tell you that beforehand. Um, it also gives me the opportunity to reach a bit further outside of the panel and smuggle in some of my own preoccupations, which I'm going to do, unfortunately, in very short. Um, working off of your central argument, well, fortunately for all of you, unfortunately for me, in short. Um, working off of your central argument and throughout the presentation, there is a tension that you make very clear and come back to regularly between the public space um, and the plurality that it comprises. Um, something defines the public space besides the individuals that occupy it. Um, otherwise, we may as well only talk about the individuals qua individuals. Um, and this, in some 
cases will sound good, but it's, it's hard to understand how equal that arrangement is really going to be. And, and that's, um, there's a potential for, for enormous inequality in, in a condition of um, individuals absent any overarching logic. In any event, it's hard to understand uh, the term inclusivity at all in that arrangement. Um, and this recalls for me a famous critique of jurisprudence. Here I'm smuggling in some of my own preoccupations. Um, a critique of jurisprudence under a liberal theory of politics in which there's a sort of double or triple or infinite bind where a com community is founded on individuals and as an object of good but without recourse to objective values which becomes difficult for the individuals. The dilemma um, that arises in this situation gives me recourse to Samuel Moyne's critique, which was linked, I believe, in the advertising material for this conference. He laments in the brief uh, uh, editorial that's linked, although it, 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 there's a larger body of scholarship behind it, um, he laments the failure of social citizenship but I think your paper um, provocatively raises the question, is that even possible under law in these political conditions where this oscillation back and forth and the strategic games it opens up is constantly going to be possible? Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Um, um, what, what I wanted to do is, uh, and if you're ca in case you're wondering about time, I'm going to be run a little bit into the break to catch up our late start, uh, to give each of you a very brief um, um, opportunity for a reply to Jeff, if you want. If you uh, just uh, think, well, I still have to think about this and want to postpone that, you can, and then I'll open it up to the floor. But um, please, um, Julia, let's take it in order. And yeah, please, please uh, move around the mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to thank first in the beginning to the organizers uh, for putting together this conference because it's really, really good to put like such a diverse topics together because I think that they do speak to each other. Also, uh, Jeff pointed that out. And thank you, Jeff, for really, really useful comments uh, because this is something what I'm uh, struggling with. I do believe that in citizenship studies, we need new vocabulary. I do strongly believe this because like, there are certain things that are happening that uh, actually I see in other presentations as well that cannot be uh, described with uh, the vocabulary okay, that, uh, that we are using currently. Unfortunately, I didn't send you the right uh, PowerPoint. That's, that's my main problem where I didn't even put the definition uh, of what I mean by the invisible edge of citizenship. But I think that I'll just give you an example. Uh, I'll just give an example of what I think is an invisible edge, where, like, for example, certain policies are claimed to improve the position of marginalized minorities. For example, uh, Roma were often put into segregated schools or, like, uh, taken away from uh, their families in order that they get civilized. The same with Aborigines in, in Australia. I mean, and we can find a lot, a lot of different policies that are somehow either for the benefit of the, uh, like uh, seen as for benefit of uh, the Roma or are neutral, but contribute to marginalization. And uh, that's how I like basically define, uh, I try to define the edges. And it doesn't really fit the multicultural citizenship because multicultural citizenship is talking about something else. It does connect very much to what Christine uh, was saying about the paradox of uh, in order to integrate, you basically exclude somebody to uh, uh, marginality. So do, I do believe uh, that we need a new uh, vocabulary. I'm not sure yet if it's going to be like something like edges of citizenship or fringes of citizenship, where you have more of a also that this is where the citizenship get changed also from the groups that are being discriminated against. But I'm still thinking about, so this is very briefly. Thank you very much. It was really useful. Thanks. Okay. Um, Leonie, and I'll give you this one. Um, well, uh, thank you for your valid comments. Um, and uh, beginning with your point on the stakeholders or the Prince Charmings in our piece. Um, well, of course, I myself like to believe that there are Prince Charming in uh, the fight for travelers' rights. Um, but 
what I see what binds these stakeholders is that they all are interested in human rights protection in one way or another. Um, and so they're stakeholders in human rights protection. Um, but I agree that maybe uh, another terminology would be uh, better in place. So we're absolutely open for ideas. So uh, please shout out uh, ideas for a better term uh, used. Maybe we should just uh, go with Prince Charming. Um, uh, the other point you mentioned was the modesty in our piece. Um, and one of the things that I want to mention about that is that in our piece we try to build up a causal relationship between the actions of these uh, Prince Charmings uh, and uh, the change of uh, the government stands. And it's, of course, very difficult to establish such a relationship because we don't know for sure that all these actions and what the actions... Um, in, in what way they affected uh, the change of the government. Um, so, but maybe I can uh, ask uh, <laughs> around. Um, um, and I think also there's some modesty from our regard because we both came, became involved um, from the National Ombudsman and for me from PIL perspective, but only as regards to the specific issue of traveler camps policy in the Netherlands. So it's difficult to take it into a broader perspective. Um, so maybe there's some mo modesty, but trying to leave that modesty behind. Uh, some of the points that I think that we can learn from this is that um, by, tech, by addressing one issue from various perspectives through different means, so uh, media attention, but also litigation uh, at the national courts, uh, trying to have conversations with local governments, national governments, um, getting cases to the Dutch equality body, uh, all those different uh, ways of addressing the same issue will ha eventually be able to put the, the issue on the agenda, the political agenda, and hopefully uh, make some changes. Uh, and I think travelers themselves did a great job in, in putting it on the political agenda because they were the ones that mobilized all those other more legal uh, uh, of nature stakeholders. So uh, those were my points. Do you want to? No, I don't think I have anything to say. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just looking a little bit at the time and uh, and the panel. <laughs> I think Helen. Um, okay, I, I left out enacted citizenship. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no response from you. Or, no, it's no? very, very useful. I've written it all down, and I'm actually going to make a point. Thank yeah. you very much. Really. Um, then I turn to Kristen as a, a response. Yeah, really microphone. microphone, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. sorry. I was thinking my voice carries, but then it doesn't apparently. Okay, so, so. No, but thank you very much. I didn't see that the critical question was more like comments, and I really, yeah, very much it ties into, it's also about questions of neutrality, right? So in principle, uh, public authorities are supposed to be neutral. To some extent, they cannot be neutral, especially when you talk, talk about language, for example. They have to choose a language in which they communicate. I know South Africa is very progressive in that respect, but nevertheless, you have to make a choice in a particular language that you're going to communicate. Uh, in terms of others, it's, it might be possible, but it's often de facto not the case, and that's often the case with religion, and it has then to do with the way society has been structured over time with the majority at the time, right? So, uh, which ties into the determination of what are the public holidays, what are the, the weekly days of rest, that's all, the, I mean, you see it here in Europe, it's very determined by Christianity, right? So that doesn't come out of nowhere, but you need to recognize it's not, it's bloody not neutral. Even though the government, the court always says, you know, government needs to be neutral, blah, 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 but it's not the case. And that brings you down in the, indeed to new, I think the need to have new ways of looking at the public space, that it's something that needs to be co determined. And then the question is, but who? Who's entitled to co determine how the public space is determined? And that brings me to my new project, my nationality project, which brought me to citizenship studies as well. And I'm still very much in the beginning of that. So, I mean, often, I mean, for some rights, rights are limited to questions of nationality in the sense of legal citizenship. And so I'm now through the studies I'm doing, I'm just critically looking at what is the most appropriate connecting factor for several of these rights. And so more generally also for who is entitled to co-determine the public space. And I'm going to stop here because everybody else wants to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. I was just going to you know, give you subtle signs, but I, since I can't see you, that was difficult. Uh, <laughs> no, no I, was, I was just starting. So um, that means we can open it up to, uh, for discussion uh, with the floor. Please try to keep your uh, comments or questions fairly brief so that we do have 
time also for responses. And uh, we have a third microphone. Uh, Nicola and Jackie, I see. Are there, uh, if there are others, please raise your hands clearly. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm get to, yeah. Um, Nicola, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Nicola Jegers. I'm a professor of human rights law at Tilburg University. But in all honesty, I have to also reveal my other identity here because I'm actually a commissioner, a commissioner at the Prince Charming, at the National Human Rights Institute. Um, I was not involved in any of the travelers' cases, neither was I involved in the advice of the National Human Rights Institute, and I'm also speaking here not in that capacity. So after all those disclaimers, uh, my uh, comment, um, because there's something that troubles me in um, the whole issue of the travelers in the Netherlands. And that's the grouping together of the people living in caravans as travelers, as one group, um, which is Roma, Sinti, and a whole bunch of other people that for different reasons also live in caravans. And the number of places for uh, travelers, people that live in caravans, um, is very limited. It's very, uh, there are very few places. So what are the implications? And it comes from the title of this conference, Human Rights Inside, Outside. So when a very vocal group, representatives of the Roma or the Sinti or some other group, invokes equality laws before the commission or uh, human rights laws, the development in the Netherlands seems to be going in the right direction, for whatever reason, towards protection of this group. So what happens when one of the other groups says we actually want our own a group of uh, caravans. So only for the Roma, or only for the Sinti, or only for whatever group. So isn't there something very problematic in grouping, making a rather simple division between people not living in caravans and travelers? Okay, thank you. Uh, th thank you. I'm going to take a couple of questions and then uh, turn to the panel. Uh, Jackie was... Uh, Next Thanks. I wanted to ask Kristen about her really incredibly interesting paper. I must say that this is an issue that I find a real uh, confrontation um, and a really difficult one to think about how to resolve. Um, for me, I really think about what Arundhati Roy has said, because I must admit that personally it affects me when I see women covered up. It freaks me out as a woman. I've got to admit that personally. Um, but I think about what Arundhati said is, is that um, trying to force people out of burqas is just as bad as trying to force them into burqas. And I think, you know, that is something that really guides me in this. But I was wondering, and I'm not that familiar with the EU jurisprudence on this, although I know these cases, how, how do you think from a jurisprudential basis and perhaps human rights more generally, social justice, uh, it would have gone if you had, uh, instead of state integration, social policy, citizenship, nationality, whatever, um, on the one side, and minority religious rights on the other. If it was two minority rights pitted against each other, um, women's rights uh, not to be discriminated against versus um, religious rights, and, and whether that would make a difference or how one should address that. Thank I don't you. know if that, if, does that make sense? In the sense that women who who feel offended by seeing uh, women, other women, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a well, you, uh, yeah. you have a little bit of time to think. Could you pass it over? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Emilia Bratanova van Harten, and I'm a master student at Leiden University in human rights law. Um, my question is also uh, towards uh, Professor Christine Henrard. Um, my interest lies in the area of refugee integration, so I'm looking at integration from another perspective, mostly that of newcomers. And we can see that in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights that you analyzed, integration um, is present as a manifestation of the majoritarian understanding of the way of life. Mm -hmm. um, and the court unfortunately uses it um, in a way to exclude people but as you said, integrations, uh, the, the, the idea of the concept of integration is to include. 
but because of these developments, uh, not only on the level of the European Court of Human Rights, but on a national level, there have been researchers uh, who say, well, we need to get rid of integration altogether because it leads to exclusion. Um, however, from my perspective, uh, I've been asking myself the question, uh, what happens if there is absolutely no support for inclusion on the part of the state? like uh, it is in the case of some Central uh, and Eastern European countries vis-a-vis -vis refugees. So I was wondering whether you would also agree with uh, this line of reasoning, uh, just get rid of integration, or you also see a more promising possibility for conceptualizing integration. Thank you. Okay, well, I want to take one, uh, one more question, and I, uh, over here. <laughs> I'll just take my mic um, and then uh, give the panel the, the chance to respond. Thank you. Um, my name is Fernanda. I'm a postdoc here at ISS. And my question also to Kristen and follows up uh, quite closely on Jackie's um, that because there has been always this tension between feminism and multiculturalism and this kind of paradigm shift from multiculturalism towards integration, where does that leave feminism? Is, fem is the feminist argument now kind of instrumentalized for the integration argument and so I was wondering if the court cases made any reference whatsoever to those kind of claims like we need to protect women from cultural claims to control yes. were there any explicit yes. references or not uh, thank you uh, well um, Kristen do you need some time to think no, and okay, uh, okay. Um, I think um, Claire Leonie well, do you want Claire Nicola uh, Jaeger, like uh, about the classification of yeah using a classification like travelers and I think yeah using classifications is always problematic and there are always problems with using classifications and uh, in the case of for example the travelers uh, different classifications are used so for example the European Union uses Roma as a classification and under that uh, definition also uh, travelers are included so that's uh, the, the other way around they use um, Roma as an umbrella term. And also in uh, practice we can see that, uh, as Nicola um, <coughs> mentioned, that Roma and Sinti do not want sometimes to live in the same uh, traveler camps. So there are also tensions between uh, these um, communities or communities which fall in the same uh, classification. So of course this, uh, this brings up uh, problems, but I think it's a starting point to use to look at okay, who, what kind of people want to live in the, in the caravan and start from that because the most important point now for the travelers is to get more caravan plots and um, that they can live uh, together is also very important for their uh, culture but I think we should not think too much about um, that they also want to live together and that also maybe leave that to the people instead of uh, also uh, think about that on a more professional level, but um, hope that it will, these problems will, so, will be solved more by the people themselves. I think maybe Leonie can... Well, uh, I, I think it's a good question because uh, um, I know from Bill and I know from some other stakeholders that they are struggling with this issue as well. Uh, and there are some examples at this moment in the deliberations on the new guide that uh, some uh, more vocal groups were representing certain groups, and then uh, Bill received uh, an email saying, well, we're not represented and we're not happy with what we see at this point. So what we try to do at that stage is, so we understand your point, um, and uh, well, we try to uh, communicate that to the government and ask them what they would sit down with those people uh, in order to include their voice as well. Uh, in relation to the struggle that will continue to exist because there is a lack of caravans. Um, that is a difficult one and I, I don't have an answer to um, what, what you can do about that because what we see at this point is that certain groups are saying, well, they are not entitled to those caravan plots because they, they don't come from caravans but they used to live in tents so they should not be entitled to caravans. And that is a problematic issue, and I don't know exactly how to 
to deal with those things. That's a really uh, difficult pol politi uh, policy point of view, and I think uh, we definitely need to think about that further uh, along. Okay. Um, women's rights versus religious rights. Two, two things here. Um, Actually, in the SAS case, uh, one of the, well, the, the government, the French government, came up with three legitimate aims. Uh, one had to do with security reasons. No? Okay. One had to do with security reasons. The court dismissed that because, you know, security, yes, if it would have been concerned with, you know, go to an embassy or whatever, but that wasn't the point. It was too general in that respect, so they couldn't evoke that. And they also came with the equality argument. And the court here actually follows up on something that it already recognized in Laila Sahin that, um, or a subsequent case just after that, that um, you, know, you can't invoke the rights of women um, as a countervailing factor here because you, know, you have to respect that this is a choice of women as well. So this question, what you also, I mean, you, know, you cannot invoke general, the court just didn't accept the argument that it would be legitimate aim, the equality of women to uh, justify this particular law. So that was just, I like I liked that very much. That was one of the very good points. So SAS is not all bad. There are very good, several good points in SAS. Um, um, and another thing is, you know, having the right to manifest a religion, that is a recognized fundamental right. There is no fundamental right not to be offended, not to be shocked, not to be whatever. I personally actually sometimes also don't feel comfortable when I see these women walking around in burqa. I'm sorry, I mean, I have to be honest. Sometimes I feel, it makes me slightly feel, why do you do this? And so I also don't understand. But at the same time, I respect, this is your choice, this is your freedom to manifest your religion. Glad, I would almost say, right? So it's not on the same level. Because, and it's also something that has been uh, notified in regarding to SAS and the arguments, the way that case had panned out that it runs, I mean, the, it carries the risk, the danger that anything the majority feels uncomfortable with can then be criminalized in the name of, right? It's just, it's a slippery slope. Once you go down that route, it's very difficult to put a stop, so no. Um, the concept of integration, I maybe, well, I've, I've talked a lot to people from social science with us, and I, I'm fully aware of the fact that this, the idea of the concept of integration is on its way out. Um, so the, you know they don't like the concept of integration anymore, and I think, but it doesn't take away the fundamental problem. The fundamental question will remain the same: How do you make sure a society is cohesive? How do you make sure that the different components of it fit together? It's all about. It's still about the same. They may not like the word, but the concept, the problems they're struggling with are going to be 